Welcome to the CEC Report for the 14th of September 2018. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. This is a special global financial crisis anniversary episode of the CEC Report because tomorrow, Craig, is the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the Wall Street Investment Bank which triggered the global meltdown that occurred afterwards. So we're calling this episode of the CEC Report the Australian banking crisis of 2008 and why it's worse today. Now, before we begin, I've got a couple of announcements to make. First, one of the things we'll discuss here in this episode, as we always do, is Glass-Steagall, the importance of breaking up the banks. And we're going to, we're going to give more evidence today about from 2008 about why it's absolutely necessary. It was the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999 that had caused the scale of the problem that melted down in 2008. So we have to get this principle back into the financial system and as regular viewers know, the CEC drafted a bill, the Banking System Reform Separation of Banks Bill 2018, that on the 25th of June, Bob Catter and Andrew Wilkie introduced into Parliament. So there's a bill in Parliament now in Australia to break up the banks. And we have to continue to mobilise on that and actually escalate. The campaign of that is important. And the focus of the campaign now is to get it debated. Yes. Because as things stand, Craig, we've got a new Prime Minister, but every utterance he's made since coming in has been continuing his protection of the banks, right? So we can't expect the government to do it. A lot of it's going to come down to the Labor Party. And so the, as we'll discuss this at the end as well, but viewers, if you, haven't, if you aren't already involved, get involved. If you are already involved, do more. Continue to um, contact your members of Parliament to demand they debate the Bob Catter bill for separating the banks. This is crucial, right? The, the, if we don't get speculation cut out of the financial system that we use, we are all going to, you know, suffer terribly in the next financial crisis because one will be inevitable. All right. So, and as part of that, this week the CEC um, in the Australian Alert Service, our weekly publication, there's a copy in here, and we also put out a press release about it, and it's called. Banking expert destroys Treasury arguments against Glass-Steagall. And this is the refutation that Dr. Wilson Sy, who's a former principal researcher at APRA, has written in response to the, the, the official Treasury letter that's been circulating for four years saying we don't need banking separation in Australia. Mm. Now, this Treasury letter is packed full of lies. It's, and Wilson That's what's stunning about it, Robbie. I mean, it, it's just so clear-cut. I mean, Wilson, of course, was a, um, the head of the... Research division research, of yep. APRA for, for APRA for quite a long period of time, so he knows this inside and out. He goes through and nails these liars for what they are. Yes, where they where they're actually specifically lying. Now the average punter, it's point by point. He goes yeah, the, the average person you know doesn't know where to stand, but he as a, as a specialist knows exactly what these lies are, and it's stunning how blatant that they are. And the most important thing about what he's done is this is what. Treasury sends to members of parliament. Yeah. So you, the viewer, you, the Australian people, go to their member of parliament and say, you should do something about breaking up the banks. We need Glass-Steagall. They, the good ones, they kick that upstairs and say, they approach the government or the Treasury and say, what about Glass-Steagall? And they get this reply back. And it's, they don't know how to refute it because they're not qualified enough. Wilson's sigh is, and what he's done here is devastating. So get a copy of this if you haven't already got one. You can call in and get a copy of the alert service. Take that to your Member of Parliament, email it to your Member of Parliament, make, insist they read it, insist they give you a response in writing and insist they support the separation of banks bill. Mm, right. So that's, that's, the, that's the marching orders for today and we'll come back to that at the end. Secondly, um, on the weekend, Craig, we put up on YouTube a video by Denise Braley of the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association that she presented to the CEC seminar in Perth on the 30th of June, which you, you, you um, uh, were there for. Now, this is a devastating video, what Denise has done. Denise is the leading expert on mortgage fraud in Australia, and it's called Mortgage Fraud Explained. But what she does is, in exposing this, it, she's gone far deeper than anything that came out of the Royal Commission. She shows that the system here is rotten to its core, this is the biggest part of banking in Australia, mortgages, and it's, and it's riddled with the rottenness of mortgage fraud. She exposes that. And fundamentally what she exposes is if this, this is defining our economy. We, there is no way we will not crash as an economy because of how bad this is. I want to play a quick um, clip of Denise just to give you a sample. 
We're going after a royal commission that lasts what I asked for in the first place. Two to three years, add the regulators onto it, add the receivers onto it from the business point of view. Add the politicians onto it. Add whoever needs to be in there to be exposed. Absolutely. Because this is where Australia's at. And what the problem is this, in meetings I've had, yeah, but Denise, if we do that, we'll crash the economy. Well, if we're going to crash the economy, we've got a problem, haven't we? So, so that's, de I mean, and there's, there's 50 minutes of that. Watch it. That's devastating. What Denise is saying is, saying is if our financial system is dependent on keeping this financial fraud um, under the carpet, we have a problem, right? And this, as we'll go through, Craig, is the same problem that caused the global financial crisis in 2008. So this is a very, very important video. If you haven't already seen it, so, um, make sure you watch it. It's on the, if you're a Channel 31 viewer or Channel 44 viewer and you're not watching on, on YouTube, go to the YouTube channel CEC Australia. You'll see it up there. Watch it and share it widely. I'll, I'll, I'll go so far as to say this. Do not um, take out a mortgage without seeing this video first. That's how important it is. Now, normally, Craig, when it comes to the question of mortgages and spruikers and, you know, people are used to getting advice on mortgages, everyone giving them advice has an agenda. That is, they, they, they want to they sell them something, yeah. right? They'll tell you how great it is. Denise Braley does not have an She has no ulterior motive. She doesn't make a cent out of this. She, is, she, she deserves to have made a lot more money. She does everything she does voluntarily. She has everything she knows is from her tireless work defending victims. This is the most impartial voice on this subject in Australia, the most credible voice. R watch it, share it, and make sure your Member of Parliament watches it. Right? This is an incredibly important um, piece of, uh, of, of, the, of the picture of the Australian financial system that everyone must know. It's why the Royal Commission must be extended, because it didn't get time to touch on the, even the, the, a sliver of it, really. They, they, it was just barely touching the sides. So um, that's very crucial. Anyway. That said, let's take a break and when we come back, we will get into the meats, the, 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 the meat and potatoes of the Australian banking crisis of 2008 and why it's worse today. Welcome back to our special Global Financial Crisis Anniversary episode of the CEC Report, the Australian banking crisis of 2008 and why it's worse today. Now, what we're about to go through is also a feature in this week's Australian Alert Service. So if you, if you haven't read the Alert Service before, call in for a free copy um, and you can read the details of what we're going to... So we'll touch on it as well as we can, Craig, in the time we have. But the details are in there. Um, there's two articles that are, that are, that are particularly are important, which is um, one, one I wrote on page five, Australia did not avoid the GFC, the Australian banking crisis of 2008. And then there's another article on page eight, financial system more vulnerable than 2008 and we're less prepared. Yeah, I mean, that's a phenomenal article, Rob, because it goes through leaders around the world in high places, you know. Well, it gives uh, the international dimension to it. And gives us that, that, that dimension to it, yeah. All right, now, let's begin, Craig, by reminiscing about 10 years ago. And I want to play a Over clip. 10, Robbie, we've got 30. That's true. That's true. But 10 years ago, it all came, everything we said had come to a head. So I want to play a clip of Julia Gillard's reflections on the global financial crisis. Um, no one 12 months ago was talking about a global financial crisis. Now everybody is talking about a global financial crisis. So there she is. No one saw this coming, effectively, is uh, what she was trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. So, well, see, Robbie, that's, that's the complete fraud in itself. Well, show but, us the evidence from our standpoint that that's obviously not true. Let's go back to 2007 before it broke out in, in earnest. You know, here is a copy of the New Citizen. We're producing hundreds of thousands of these, Robbie. That's from 12 months before the 12 GFC. 12 months before the GFC. Financial crisis, fi so, so financial crash is on. Right, and nations must turn to LaRouche. Now, LaRouche is fe featured here because he is the world's leading physical economist. And I'll say more about that curve that you see there, LaRouche's triple curve function, in a minute. Because we've been talking about this, Robbie, for, since 1994. 
right? So, so you that, come was, back that was 12 months earlier. 12 months earlier, come back another year. This is 18 months before that. Yeah, world teeters on brink of financial crash, right? So we were seeing all the markers of a financial crash well before everyone. We weren't just sitting on it. We were publishing these papers to the tune of hundreds of thousands of copies and spreading yep. them around yep. the country. Warning everyone. And then you go back again. This is, a, the, this is to June 2005, so this is another... You know, 10 months before that, mother of all bubbles exploding, you know, great derivatives crash, mother of all bubbles exploding, political earthquakes underway. And specifically there, now all the articles that we've, you've referred to talk about derivatives, which is what melted down in 2008. Yeah. This one was the most explicit telling people, look, there's this huge problem in the economy, you've got to look at it. And bear in mind, Robert, you know, the derivatives total in 2008 was $14 trillion. Yes. Today, it's $40, 40 trillion. trillion. So nothing stopped here. But see, Robbie, the reason... That's, we, in a, that's Australian derivatives. The reason we've been able to, to make these uh, forecasts, you might say, is because of our history with Mr LaRouche as the world's leading physical economist. And he published in 1994 as a device for people to understand what's happening in the world economy that device was called his triple curve function. And you see three lines on that triple curve function. The first, of course, is the one that's going through the floor, the physical economic input outputs. That's what nations produce, Robbie. So you've seen a collapse in physical economic output, the real things that people need, manufactured goods and so forth. But at the same time, you've seen an absolute explosion, a hyperbolic increase in things like derivatives like we've just talked, and yeah. also things like money printing, quantitative easing. And he forecast that this cannot continue, it's going to come to an end. The original curve, Craig, didn't have those two top curves crossing. No, no, they didn't. They that, that curve was printed because of the fact that in response to the explosion in derivatives, the money printing had started to keep pumping it up. Absolutely. And, and this is our history and it's, it's on our website, Robbie, and there's plenty more to say about this, but I think that's the backdrop. And so yeah. this idea that no one, no one could thought. see the financial crisis looming or coming or whatever Julia Gillard was lying about was in fact just a straight pure lie. And it is a lie because it was part, there was a, the, we're going to talk at length about the cover up in Australia at the time. So you've made that point adequately Craig. I'll just cite also, we, by definition, we know from the movie The Big Short and the book that I've just finished reading actually, there were, there were actually people in America three years before it happened betting it would happen. So there was and, and they and the the um, if you've seen the movie The Big Short, the 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 character who's played by Christian Bale, Dr. Michael Burry, he said he based his expectation of a crash on two things: the reckless lending by banks, and he distinguished between the lending and the borrowing. He said not the reckless borrowing; borrowers always tend to be a bit reckless. It's the reckless lending by banks that's the problem, and mortgage fraud. He saw the mortgage fraud, right? And those two predicates are exactly true for Australia today. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I, you didn't have to be Einstein to figure it out, though they were a minority, so, but they did see it. And then this bit, Craig, came out last night on ABC 730. And this is quite um, revealing, again, in the light of what Julia Gillard said, who, who at the time was the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. Because she said no one saw it coming. Well, according to Pradeep Phillip, um, who was the Rudd government's policy director, on ABC 7.30 last night, he said that since the beginning of 2008, the Rudd government had been wargaming a financial disaster. So just have a look at him saying that. Months earlier, at the start of 2008, the Rudd government was already wargaming disaster scenarios. What would happen if, for instance, there was a capital strike on the balance of payments against Australia? How would that work through? What will be the consequences? How would you deal with that? We work through scenarios. What if there was sovereign default? The country went bust. So that's quite revealing, Craig. And, the, and, and it straight away got my attention because, because this was our issue, we, the CEC, was, were doing all this work, warning people it was going to happen, and then at the time trying to tell people what was happening. One of the things that we knew was going on at the time was the greatest cover-up of all time. Because mm -hmm. there was, I'm gonna go through what was happening behind the scenes in Australia, but if you lived through it, what you may remember was the constant refrain from the government was, Australia's banks are sound. And the consensus to this day is Australia escaped the global financial crisis because of the sound prudential regulation of our banks by APRA and the Rudd government's um, actions, right? So APRA gets the credit, the Rudd government gets the credit, but fundamentally we weren't threatened really because our banks were sound. 
So the article that we've written in the alert service totally refutes that. Let me just go through briefly the major predicates that you can then read the article for the details. First of all, we know the, ult the ultimate issue was a housing bubble. Not, not just in America, in Europe, in Ireland, in Britain, etc. And, and when and the bubble was based on reckless lending for people who shouldn't have had, you know, the, normally the banks wouldn't extend those kind of loans and those people started defaulting, right? Well, Australia had its own bubble. It was denied, officially everyone denied it. There was no doubt a, a bubble. By 2008, prices had, had roughly quadrupled since 2000. And more importantly, the practices of our financial system were similar. So even though, for instance, with something called mortgage securitization, which is, what it, which is what really encouraged the banks to get into mortgage lending because they could lend the mortgage and make money from that mm. and then securitize it mm. and on sell it and make even more from that, mm -hmm. right? Um, we were lagging behind the United States. So by 2008, their, their securitization rate on mortgages was 50%, ours was 25%, but ours was growing fast, right? This was the big thing that we were, that we were getting into as well. Also, Australia had its own subprime problem, Craig, and it was as big a problem as a percentage of our mortgage market as the United States. That's the low docs issue. Low doc yep. and no doc loans. And these were these were types of mortgages that had, like with subprime, they'd been a basis for, for coming up with them in the first place. They were for tradies, et cetera, who don't have the normal pay slips and stuff. And in 2000, they were 1% of all mortgages. But when the banks wanted to go big on mortgages and they ran out of people who could afford to, to, um, to, to borrow and went to people who couldn't afford to borrow, they took they exploited these types of low doc, no doc mortgages to justify that, where they could hide a lot of fraud in these things. And by 2008, they were 20% of all mortgages. Well, 20 guess times. That's, that's right. 20 times in eight years. And that 20% yep. is exactly the same percentage as subprime mortgages were of the US market. So yep. we had the same problem in our system. And Denise Brady, I think, makes a point now, Robbie, it's up to 80%. Well, she's, she's talking in general yeah. about all, she, she uses the term subprime more generically, yeah. right, to mean anything that's dodgy. Oh, right. And, and, and so, yeah, 80%. Percent of dodgy loans. And her, she bases that on because she goes and talks to the brokers and say, what sort of mortgages are you selling? And they admit to her, look, 80% of what we're selling are interest only, and that's the main category of what she calls subprime in Australia. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. So these, these are all a worry. Um, well, even, the, even that's just a worry in itself. I mean, absolutely, there's no security here. There's a brewing problem in yeah. our system, and that's why we say why it's, why it's worse. Uh, people may remember interest rates in Australia had been rising until 2008. Um, they'd gone up from, two, started going up in 2004. They'd hit more than 7%. There was a lot of defaults going on in Australia on the back of those interest rates. Housing was completely unaffordable. In fact, it, was the, it cost John Howard the election. The biggest issue in the 2007 election was the cost of living crisis, and that had been driven by the rising interest rates on mortgage debt, right? Um, so prices had started falling. Now, what we now know, now we knew this at the time, what we didn't know at the time came out in 2016, and it was reported on ABC, that a APRA in 2007, had a, a, an internal report had been produced into mortgage lending and the, the effect of lowered living, lending standards, i.e. the more reckless lending. And that report said because of the lowered standards, the amount of mortgage debt in Australia is three and a half times what it would have been otherwise under the older standards, the more, the more conservative standards. So that was identifying a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. And that forecast, look, the way it's going, we're going to have a crash here and we're going to have a recession, right? APRA buried that report to keep that. That's a huge scandal which, which deserves more this attention. our regulator. Our regulator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Also, but so, so these are the things that led up to it. By the time Lehman Brothers crashed in 2008, September 2008, there was a total panic. And the biggest, the biggest point of the panic you hear was Australia's banks, to fuel all this lending they were doing, had been borrowing heavily from overseas on short term terms, 90 days. They had 440 billion in 90 day debt. And the overseas creditors after Lehman went under called in $50 billion of that. Mm. And our banks were all caught out. And that's what caused more panic than anything else. So let's take a quick break and we'll continue this after the break. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're talking about the Australian banking crisis of 2008 and why it's worse today. And I'm going through a series of predicates, Craig, on what actually happened in 2008. So, now, so 
It's, it's September 2008. Our banks have $440 billion they owe overseas on three-month terms. That means they've got to roll it over every three months, and suddenly they can't, and their overseas creditors have called in $50 billion. What, what ensued was total panic. Now, it came out later in 2010, the age got freedom of information documents that showed Macquarie Bank hit the panic button first. On the day Lehman went under, they're calling Canberra to raise any contact they could to beg the government to protect them. Yeah, hang right? on, Robbie, this is Macquarie Bank. They don't want government intervention. Oh, yeah, no government intervention for anyone else, but no, to no. save their butts, that's what they wanted it. That's, that's the way it always works, so. Exactly, of course, because it's their, their theories, Craig, are, are actually lies. It's, yeah. it's, it's hypocrisy. They're, they're looting mechanisms, these banks. Um, the, all the banks begged the Rudd government for guarantees, and this was revealed by Ross Garner, who was the former economics advisor to Bob Hawke, and his co-author David Llewellyn Smith in a book they wrote called The Great Crash of 2018. And they talk about how the banks went to uh, Rudd, and this is the quote from the book. The banks told Rudd that if the government did not guarantee their foreign debts, they would not be able to roll over the debt as it became due. Some was due immediately, so they would have to begin withdrawing credit from Australian borrowers. They would be insolvent sooner rather than later. That's what the bank said. Oh, we're going bankrupt here, right? And that's when the government introduced the, the guarantees it did, a guarantee on deposits, a guarantee on overseas lending. And I say they did a third guarantee, Craig, which was they, they tripled the first homeowner's grant. And this was a lie. They said when they tripled it, Rudd announced we're gonna, we've got a housing affordability measure. But then another book came out by Lenore Taylor and David Uren called Shitstorm, which revealed that the reason they tripled the first homeowner's grant was to get prices up. Mm. Prices had fallen, they had to get them up because they were worried what would happen to the market and the banks if we had a housing crash in Australia just like then. But the bottom line is here, in the time we've got left, the point that the reason that they had to do these things, they, by those measures, they kicked the can down the road. Um, they have made the housing bubble much worse now because of that, right? They, they, there, was no, there was no lessons learned from 2008. Housing debt is tw more than twice as big as it was then, right? Yep. And we are therefore facing a bigger crash now. So, Craig, quickly, why is Glass-Steagall the solution to this? You've got to take the control of the credit, Robbie, of the financial system out of the private boardrooms of these criminal banking operations, as you've seen with the Royal Commission. What we need is Glass-Steagall legislation, which re-regulates the system by separating out the legitimate and necessary commercial banking system from the investment banking and all the you know, investment banking houses, share broking houses, insurance companies, and these totally behemoth, vertically integrated yep. banks that are not acting in the interest of the economy or the people. Now, that's what, so, that's what the Glass-Steagall uh, uh, bill that we have in Parliament does. It's a very simple bill, Robbie, because it says the banks can only do this. They shall not Normal do lending. Normal lending. Right? And they, what they, they can't they, do is speculate. They, that's right. It's very simple. Right, the Dodd-Frank bill in the United States said the banks can do this. And they've tried to elaborate that, and it's gone out to 800 pages, right? And so it's easy to say what they can't do. When, when, when Roosevelt brought the initial Glass-Steagall bill in for the same reasons that we're trying to do it today, that bill was only 34 pages because it was very simple. And it stood for over 60 years yep. and kept the banking system strong. So this idea that we don't need Glass-Steagall, our banks are all strong, you know, they're you know, sound and all that stuff, from Wilson Sy's article, you can see that's a complete lie. And it's going to come back and hit the politicians in the head, particularly if we start bringing this up now. And that means that the more honest politicians are going to act. And it's not up to them to, to act. They've got all sorts of other political pressures. It's up to us, that is the viewers out there, to grab hold of this material and take it to their MPs. Exactly. So that's your marching orders. That's what we need you to do. We're out of time. Get a copy of this to read the details. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, thanks for Robbie. tuning in.